Hello, and welcome to, More Intelligent Tomorrow, a wide-ranging exploration of the potential impact of AI on the world around us, as envisioned by the future heroes of the human and machine intelligence revolution. What will happen to the economy in years to come when AI automates much of the market? Are we headed into a dystopian or utopian future? We'll discuss this and more with Elan Glazer on today's episode. And now, your host, Ari Kaplan. Hey, Elan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ari. I'm happy to be here. You have had a really unique journey. You've been in the financial industry since really the 90s. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and your journey to where you are now? Yes, absolutely. Financial markets has been my passion. Since I was 18 years old, I've never had any other kinds of jobs growing up. I started uh, working in the industry um, right when I was in college. And my first job was cutting newspapers as a research analyst assistant, as an intern for investment bank. And I was way ahead of my time. I built my first neural network in 1992 when data science wasn't even a thing yet. You know, it was just uh, neural networks in Excel. So that was really interesting because nobody really understood what I was doing. And clearly the the neural network was way overfitted and did not work, but it was a great experiment. So it was a good, good starting point. And, you know, artificial intelligence has been in my career since then. I've been in multiple... Uh, working with multiple firms like banks and hedge funds and robot advisors and always from the perspective of um, either artificial intelligence or building nonlinear dynamic systems that adapt themselves to changes in the market. That has always been my my passion to understand the markets and try to make predictions uh, based on mathematical systems. So you were way ahead of your time back then. Nobody really understood what I was doing, and it was hard for me to explain. You know, the same problems we have now sometimes with explainability of uh, neural networks, obviously back then was even more complicated to explain. So my passion at the time, back in the 90s, was uh, chaos theory and fractals. So fractals uh, were kind of the, the thing back then, and using those, uh, looking for patterns in time series of stock market data and commodities data became my job, right? So I, I became a trader in a bank in Brazil, and I started using uh, those types of analysis uh, to identify opportunities to, to buy securities and sell later or short securities and sell later, which ended up uh, taking me to Wall Street. So by the time I was 24 years old, I moved from Brazil to New York with Morgan Stanley and became a derivatives trader. I ended up building my own system and uh, started trading for Millennial Management, which is uh, one of the biggest hedge funds in um, in New York. And uh, back in the day, I think this was in 2006, we were one of the first people to use NLP, Natural Language Processing, to, uh, to look at in real time market data, specifically earnings announcements and scan for news and make decisions based on that, right? So this is a technology that nowadays is pretty much commoditized, but uh, when we did that, nobody was doing it. So it was extremely fun and uh, an exciting project. Um, and then when 2008 came, was this uh, everything changed. So um, I ended up uh, becoming the chief risk officer of a bank. And at that point, we built a, um, I would say, a complex adaptive system that was able to adapt itself to changes in the market by itself. So it was an autonomous learning system, a mechanism that uh, now we call this a um, factor rotation models, right? So we have sector rotation models, factor rotation models that adjusted itself and changed the weights of the factors to do uh, global tactical asset allocation. It's uh, pretty much pervasive in the sense that AI now is everywhere uh, in finance and there's a lot of uh, growth in that area. And my job is to understand, talk to the subject matter experts, understand the problems they're trying to solve and then propose different solutions for them to to solve those problems. How do you see like the financial industry uh, having changed since you started? You know, now we have 
all these algorithms that execute trades, only 10% of the, of the volume in the market now is traded by humans, right? 90% is all automated. So it's machines trading against machines. So that's, that's totally different than when I first started. Even for the, for the, the small uh, retail investor, Nowadays, they have access to strategies that used to be only accessible to hedge fund managers through platforms, uh, robo-advisor platforms that mm -hmm. automatically adjust themselves and the weights of the portfolios to changes in the market as well. So that's been a total, total uh, radical change in the way the markets operate. Good thoughts. And um, I, I know you've written many books. I think you've had three books written and you're working on one now. Like what? What have you written? What's the title of what you're working on? When's that coming out? I published a couple of books in Brazil about economic evolution in Portuguese, and uh, the third edition is uh, coming out in the states this summer. It's uh, called "Economic Evolution: A Complex Journey into the Age of AI." So the idea of the book is to explain the evolution of economic thought from the perspective of nonlinear dynamics and complexity theory. And that leads us to explaining and understanding the economy as we know today with the advent of technology and AI. When economists first started looking at the economic phenomenon from, from the days of the classics, the uh, economic system was seen as a machine, right? So uh, based on Newtonian physics, based on uh, the, the, the idea of the uh, Enlightenment where the economy was seen uh, as a perfect um, self-regulatory system that tended to equilibrium, right? The, the, the supply and demand will, the markets will find its own equilibrium. And what I've seen and what I've learned and where the economic systems is the economy is a complex adaptive system, right? So the idea of the book is to describe this evolution, how the, the vision, the economic vision went from a machine to an economy as an ecosystem or an organic living uh, entity. What are some examples of how the world is more complex than just simple physics? So if we think of the, of the economy from the perspective of the classical and neoclassical economists, they had to make a lot of assumptions about how individuals behave in order for their mathematical models to close, right? To find the general equilibrium uh, theory to be proved mathematically they had to assume, for example, that individuals had perfect information, that they were rational, that, that all the information was already discounted in the prices of securities. Therefore, the, the systems were always moving towards equilibrium. In the times where uh, Joseph Schumpeter, for example, which is an Austrian economist, started talking about creative destruction, where the economy uh, destructed itself, but then it will regrow and this, this, it was sort of like a, a survival of the fittest uh, situation where uh, stronger firms will then take over the markets and create um, new products and then technology will evolve and that endogenous system was in and of itself self-reinforced, which is similar to what we, we are seeing now, right? With AI, if we think about the, techno, uh, the, the economic evolution that's been happening because of the uh, intelligence revolution that started in the, uh, with the internet age, for example. Now we're in a situation where we have multiple technologies converging uh, to a uh, possibility of an economic singularity where the means of production uh, will be completely uh, automated as well as even the production of ideas. Right? So that could generate a situation where the, um, the singularity uh, will happen, meaning economics will be um, seen not only as a self-reinforcing system, but potentially as a way of uh, redistributing income and minimizing inequality by uh, the use of this, uh, the, the policies related to this technology. You know, the economy has been growing so so much for so long that it came to a point in, in, in capitalism where we don't even take into account the limitations of the planet, right? The, the scarcity of the resources of the planet, they're not necessarily taken into account in a way that provides for uh, um, a stable um, planet and, and environment. So things are changing in a way where 
if the problem we're trying to solve for are, is not necessarily solve for scarcity, but now we have abundance, how do we distribute this abundance in a fair and equitable way so the individuals that actually will be displaced by the new technology can also participate in the, uh, in the abundance and, and have uh, a decent life? Yeah, this, this is super fascinating. And I like how your background of seeing some of the automation of trading systems and financial systems has already happened. And now, like, what stage do you think we are of, like, the economy reinventing itself, either automating or, or getting you know, to, to the next level? The next five to ten years are going to be very challenging for us. If you think about the, the fact that we have 10 million drivers in this country and pretty soon we're going to have self-driving trucks, that we have 3 million um, um, people working in stores as cashiers and the stores are going um, automated as well, there will definitely be displacement, massive displacements for the lower task kind of jobs in the economy. And the idea is that some of these people will be able to be reintegrated in society if, if they can be retrained and reskilled uh, and learn new, new skills to be able to perform new jobs. So some studies have shown that the types of jobs that are going to be displaced are the ones that are the lower paying jobs and the ones with the lower uh, educational levels. But um, it's not clear to me how those people, are, are, these, these individuals are going to be reskilled. So, for example, if you're a, a 60-year-old Uber driver, what's going to happen to you? Are you expected to become a, a data scientist now or to become a geneticist that can design uh, babies and pets for people? I don't think so. Maybe they can be reskilled to become uh, the people that actually maintain the, those robots, right? So if you're a truck driver... Instead of driving the truck, now we're going to be maintaining the truck. Right? Somebody's going to actually have to maintain those machines that are going to be automated uh, and, and, and replacing those workers. Another idea that is circulating out there is the idea of uh, universal basic income. So this idea in every individual in the United States, man, woman, and child will receive a minimum basic income. Uh, and that will replace the safety net that we have now. So Medicaid or Social Security or unemployment, that will disappear and that will be then replaced by something that's more simple, that's uh, the same for everybody. We see three types of scenarios, right? So given the economic singularity where the, the means of production will be um, centralized in the hands of the few that control the, the AI, then you're going to have two classes. Right? In the dystopian future, you could potentially have two classes like uh, Yuval Harari says. You have the gods and the useless. The gods are the ones that control the, the AI and the useless are everybody else. Right? So the danger is that the AI will continue to increase what we've seen in uh, income inequality. Uh, nowadays, 1% uh, of the population, the global po uh, po uh, population controls 60% of wealth. Right. And, and uh, with the rise of AI, that trend is just going to continue to increase, just like we've seen in the past with the other technologies, how other technologies also increase the uh, income inequality. The idea is that AI is just going to be more of the same. So in a dystopian future, the, the, this divide is just going to increase. And then certain people will have access to the best health care. They will be able to replace some of their uh, body parts with bionic body parts and they, they, therefore they can become gods and they can even put some chips in their in their brain like Neuralink and have unlimited capacity of memory and calculations and whoever doesn't have access to that will be in a big disadvantage. So that's a dystopian future. The utopian future, on the other hand, is a future where there is infinite income, meaning um, because... The, the productivity growth will be so high given that machines will take care of all the aspects of the economy, uh, abundance will then be generated. In that scenario, the humans will be so evolved because we use the machines to evolve ourselves to a point where we don't even need technology anymore. Right? So then instead of the machines getting rid of us, we hit the, the, the kill switch and we get rid of the machines and 
you know, we move on with as being humans in, in charge of our planet. That's the uto utopian future. And then there is the middle ground, which is this idea that came from uh, Kevin Kelly, who is the editor of a Wired magazine that I like. Mm -hmm. It's called Protopian, which is the middle ground between utopian and dystopian, where uh, today is better than yesterday and tomorrow is better than today. So it's a gradual increase in the life quality and, and in the society where uh, growth is not necessarily what we need anymore, but especially in the more in the richest uh, economies. But what we really need is uh, find uh, uh, the thriving point where, where uh, we actually generate um, um, situations where uh, economies are distributive by design and regenerative by design. So you have, um, you know, all the all the, the existential risks uh, that, that we have imposed uh, on ourselves by the use of technology will then be solved by technology itself, right? So then we can actually have a, a, a middle ground here that's not even dystopian or utopian. You know, going back to the universal basic income, which is a you know great theory, you had mentioned there's some uh, you know challenges to making that implemented. Um, you know, one of them I see is you know we have we have different governments in different countries. Uh, is this something that you think could be achieved in an individual country, or could it be possible for the whole world to be uh, unified? That's that's a that's a big uh, that's a big argument, right? Because um, as as humans, it seems like we we come from a place of fear and scarcity when it comes to, especially when it comes to money and income distribution. So it will have to come from from the top, right? It will have to come from governments where uh, regulatory frameworks are are in place to prevent that from happening. So what we're going to see is a bigger divide between the haves and the have-nots, meaning the rich countries that control the AI, US and China. This co these countries are the countries that are going to start accumulating more and more. And the countries that have more data will then just create that, uh, what we know as the flywheel, where um, the, their AIs are going to become more and more intelligent and learn more and faster because they have more data, while the other countries that don't have the capital to invest in those uh, technologies are going to be left behind. Yeah, so then you'll get like leaders and then like laggards, and maybe the laggards are get so far behind that they'll never be able to catch up fully. Yeah, that said, though, there's an opportunity here, you know. So I'm from Brazil, and what I'm telling my Brazilian Brazilian friends that is that this is a great opportunity for countries like Brazil to actually leapfrog um, the place that they are in the world right now. Because, for example, think about uh, telecommunications, right? So there are parts of Brazil that never uh, were able to have uh, landlines, phone lines, because the cables never got there. But then they, they leapfrog that technology with the use of cell phones. So they never needed to use that technology. So they were behind for a while, but then they caught up. I believe that AI can do the same for countries like Brazil, where they can leapfrog uh, certain aspects of their technology they were, they were lagged behind uh, by uh, deploying those technologies uh, uh, over, over a short period of time. You know, we were talking about jobs being displaced, but also people shifting their jobs. Do you think there could be a scenario where... Uh, people, there's an abundance, people get everything they need materialistically, and they can work in whatever they're passionate about. Is that possible? That to me feels, it feels a little utopian. I would love to, to go to the beach and let uh, the, uh, the algorithms trade the markets for me and not have to worry about anything. But realistically, uh, because, because the world is still dominated by humans and it will continue to be for the years to come, I don't see how that's going to happen anytime soon. Eventually, in a in a utopian scenario, yes, um, the means of production will be concentrated in the hands of the ones that own the AI, right? So that will have to what will have to happen is the big uh, monopolies that are going to be formed by the ones that control the AI, like we're seeing now with Google and and, and Facebook, you know, those platforms are going to continue to grow, other platforms are going to emerge, and they are the ones that are going to control the AI and accumulate capital. So these people are either going to have to be taxed or they're going to have to be 
conscious enough to realize that the world is not going to work like that, right? Because then they're going to be displaced and every, everybody's just going to hate them. So then you have to redistribute income so everybody can actually uh, have a decent life. And if that's the case, then instead of people doing jobs that they hate, which apparently 80% of people hate what they do, they will actually be able to do what they love, right? So then uh, you see uh, people that are actually artists, for example, that driving Ubers, they're actually going to be able to make a living off of what they love. That, that would be the best case scenario for me. I would love to see that happen in, in the future. I'd love to see that happen as well. Machines are not humans. I think the, what we bring to the table is love, is compassion, is empathy. And those things cannot be programmed. You know, They can be simulated, but, not, but it's not true love, right? So, Elon, this podcast is called More Intelligent Tomorrow. What does the world look like to you in five or ten years from now? I think in five or ten years, we're still going to be dealing a lot with the problems uh, caused by the, the, the technological dislocations because of the implementation of the technologies. So my, my hope is that we as humans and as a species will have the, the deep compassion and understanding that we need to support the people that are going to be displaced by reskilling them. And if not possible to reskill all of them to have some kind of safety net to allow them to have decent uh, lives. Wonderful. Well, Elon, this has been really, really fascinating. And I wanted to thank you for taking time today. Thank you, Ari. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the invitation. And uh, I'm glad that we, uh, we had this awesome conversation. Thank you so much. <laughs>